Hi guys, uh, Dr. Norberg back again. You know, once in a while I get a question. I can't believe somebody asked me that. Um, the latest one was, uh, what's a ground scrape? And it occurred to me, <laughs> and it should, you know, that I'm not sitting here in a tent like with my own sons. If we're talking about deer and things we're going to do tomorrow or what we've learned today out in the woods, things we've found. Uh, these are real, these guys are expert hunters. Uh, and a, a lot of people I talk to, I get all kinds of letters from hunters every day. I do, emails every day, all kinds of them. But when I got that one, it kind of surprised me, and it reminds me, there are lots of guys that are just getting started, you know. And for me to, to have presented 112 or something like that uh, of these YouTube presentations without somebody realizing what a ground scrape is, is not good. <laughs> so I'm going to take a minute now to talk to you about ground scrapes and antler rubs. They're related. Now, there is no deer sign that has ever been so misunderstood as those two deer signs. And I was guilty of that myself. I remember years ago, my brother and I used to say, well, we don't want to even go out in the woods and start scouting until we had frost at night. And usually, you know, about mid-October here in Minnesota is when we get frost at night. Uh, down in South Carolina, this all begins when you start getting 60 degrees at night. So it's cooler temperatures, and uh, kind of depending on the state. But up here in Minnesota, we got to have 32 degrees, and we'll start seeing antler rubs and ground scrapes. Now, I remember back when Bob, my brother Bob and I would be scouting, and we used to think, like so many hunters today, that ground scrapes and antler rubs were made, well, especially ground scrapes, with were made to attract does in heat. It was, and, and a lot of times we'd find pieces of evergreen boughs laying on the scrape, you know, at, obviously breaking off by the antlers of a buck, because the branches above were all mangled. And we thought maybe, I used to think, I remember one time I wrote a magazine article and I said, uh, it was like, a, like flowers from a lady, you know? It wasn't until I started doing my research that I began to realize that uh, part of what uh, those mangled branches above a ground scrape mean is that uh, that buck has been rubbing scalp musk. You know, I'm talking about scalp musk. Uh, you'll see a picture here and I'll kind of show you a big buck, great big dominant breeding buck. Uh, and you'll see in the picture all of the fur on the sides of his neck is all uh, Got up in vertical, the fur has gotten to be real uh, stiff, and when he turns his neck back and forth, it creates these kind of little valleys between valley, fur, valley, fur, and all the way up the neck. And the reason is up in the scalp of a, of a, of a buck are many little smaller uh, uh, glands that produce a viscous fluid, and that means thick, you know, sort of like like syrup, that contains a real uh, sharp smelling uh, musk. It's different than the musk that comes from their tarsal glands behind the hind legs. And this musk, this stuff, uh, when you get into October and into the breeding phase of rut, this, this uh, viscous fluid flows down the sides of a buck's head and back onto his neck. And the neck gets all wrinkled like that, these vertical wrinkles in the fur. And when you see a buck like that with those deep wrinkles in there, he's a dominant breeding buck, more than likely, because that big guy, and they, that seemed to be one of their characteristics. That and the arch tail, that's another story. But anyway, um, so he's been rubbing his, his sides of his face on those, and while well, he's been breaking antlers, but rubbed the sides of his face on branches overhanging this ground scrape on the ground. Uh, bucks make these ground scrapes at traditional sites. Uh, some big dominant buck might have been dominant for two or three years and they kept going to the same spot every year and making his own scrapes. 
And then he dies, he, uh, most of them die of old age, they don't die because hunters take them. Uh, the next dominant buck will start making them at the same places and probably because of all, there's residual odors in those places. That's how they readily recognize this, this strong musk on that ground scrap. Well, so anyway, like I said, down at the bottom is the ground scrape. Well, what's a ground scrape? It's a place where the buck pod, the, the turf, you know, uh, grass, leaves, maybe moss, a way to bear the soil. You see, bare dirt, a patch of bare dirt. At first it might be small. Uh, I've got photos of, of ground scrapes that have grown to be 10 feet in diameter, great big huge things. Sometimes I make one there and one right next to it, two of them. But they get bigger and bigger, and the big dominant bucks will make them, uh, they'll be more than three feet in diameter. Get way out there, get good size in time. And uh, well, then what they, when they, after they pile this way, you know, they make this spot, it looks very different. All the rest of the ground's covered with fallen leaves or snow even. And, but here's bare dirt and dirt. Pod sometimes 10 feet away, or moss, or leaves, 10 feet away from that. Like, boy, this guy was really kind of furious here. He was really kicking this stuff back and burying that dirt. Then they get, uh, then they step forward onto the, onto the scrape. All four hoofs in the scrape are close together. And then what they do, they start urinating on their back legs, the urine running down their legs. And inside the legs, down about halfway down, there's these tufts of fur that stick out on the inside, on both sides. And those tufts of fur overlie some large glands in their hind legs that produce a lot of musky uh, uh, musk. When you smell a big buck, you know, and you, you take it one, and boy, he sticks, it's coming mostly from that. And what he's doing, uh, when he urinates on his legs, the urine carries that musk and he presses those legs to So he squeezes musk out of those glands. So it gets lots of it coming out. Some of them will actually look like they're doing a hula dance and they got their rear end going from side to side while their legs are pressed together to get more and more of that musk out of those glands. And the urine runs down their legs onto the scrape. And that's how they get their tarsal musk, these are tarsal ones, onto the ground. Yeah, well, the ground scrape is covered with tarsal musk and buck urine. I don't know. I, I don't know if that adds to the impressiveness of a dominant buck's ground scrape. Maybe it does. Maybe his urine smells different than all the other bucks that live in there, right? And their urine. And when they smell, oh, that's made that by that big buck that beat the daylights out of us during the two to three. Well, this is after about the middle of, well, from September until about uh, through October. They'd been, they, every time they met together and they, they, they decided to fight, that was the buck that beat all the rest of them up. Well, he's the big boss of this whole square mile around the area here. Now, when he makes a ground scrape, he's doing, this ground scrape is not made to attract does. It's made to tell all those other bucks to stay out of here. This Wherever you find that kind of a ground scrape made by me, with all that odor, uh, it's telling you, you stay away or suffer the consequence. You know what I can do. You know, I can beat you up. I've already run you out of here. I'm telling you, I've been telling you, I ran you out of here so I don't have any competition when the does start going into estrus. Now, well, this starts middle of October. They start making those things. A big buck can make as many as 30 of those in his square mile range. And almost all of them are always within doe ranges. In that square mile bucks range, there's four or five does living in there. And each one of them has a range about 125 acres in size, which can vary from 90 to much higher up, maybe up to 200 or so. But there's four or five does living in there. And uh, uh, at least half of them have a yearling doe with them that, and yearling does are bred during their yearling year. So there's may, maybe six does living in that square mile that that buck is going to be breeding. And uh, uh, 
he doesn't want any competition from these other bucks. This is a no trespassing sign made by that big buck. That's all it's for, nothing else. Now, anything else you hear about what ground scrapes are about, or about uh, what's said on a box of some stuff uh, it's made to attract does, like doe and estrus pheromone and doe urine. If they say anything else like this attracts does, they're wrong. <laughs> and now, some people even believe that does come to the buck ground scrape like that and hang around there when they're in heat, waiting for the buck to show up. And that's silly too, because if there's another doe, especially if there's another doe and estrus in that square mile at the same time, that buck isn't going to leave that doe to come to any other doe, even though he can smell it. You know, that buck can smell that pheromone produced by a doe a mile away, maybe two miles away. Like my dog can smell female dogs and heat that far away. The bucks can too. So he knows she's in heat, but he's not going to leave that doe to come here or to come to any of the dough that, uh, the, this kind of dough urine with pheromone that you hang in a tree by your tree stand, he ain't going to come to that either if he's with a dough and heat. No, he's going to stay with the girl that he's with. So, anyway, um, but anyway, those those are made to tell other bucks, stay out of here, this is mine, this area here, wherever you find these, these are mine. Now, beginning about mid-October, when we start getting freezing temperatures here in Minnesota, all the antler bucks, even the yearling bucks, start making ground scrapes uh, for intended breeding ranges. But only one of them per square mile gets gets to stay and take advantage of, of does and heat, and that's the big dominant buck. But even yearling bucks, they'll make little ground scrapes about a foot in diameter, and they'll commonly make them at the base of a, of a small tree or sapling an inch or less in diameter. There's an antler up on a tree, and here's this one, one uh, ground scrape, only a foot in diameter. That's made by a yearling buck. And yearling buck antler rubs aren't made along trails. All the rest of them are made adjacent to trails uh, by other bucks, but they can be off trail. And commonly where the doe beds, the bedding area, or out where the doe feeds, you might find them there. Um, but uh, they don't make many of them, maybe half a dozen at most every fall. But older bucks, two and a half to six and a half, even six and a half year old bucks can be lesser bucks. They, they happen to be in a range where the big dominant buck is a lot bigger and more aggressive. And so it can, it can even be a, it can even be a, a record book buck and still not be the dominant breeding buck. So that happens. So, but at any rate, well, they're all making ground scrapes. But by the, the week, the beginning of the week before breeding begins, and like I said, breeding begins here on November 3rd, that big dominant buck will have chased all those other antler bucks, including the yearling bucks, out of his ranch. I don't you know, threaten them, you know, and they're scared to death of them now because he's beaten them up pretty good before that time to become the big dominant breeding buck for the year. So uh, they respect him and they, they know he can be real dangerous. In fact, sometimes they can be murderous, they can kill other deer. And anyway, so they're off ranch, but the trouble is those yearling bucks keep running back because they're afraid to be alone. They want to have a mother who tells them what to do when they're threatened by another great big buck like that. And so they're kind of thorn in the side of the big dominant buck. But for that reason, and others, you know, sometimes the other bucks will sneak back as well. When they smell that pheromone, they just can't help themselves sometimes. But anyway, uh, the big dominant buck from that time on is going to be traveling around his range a lot, day and night, not sleeping much. Uh, he wants to keep that area clear of any other bucks. He doesn't want them in there. And during that time, he will renew this, those musk odors, you know, on the overhanging branches and on the ground, every 24 to 48 hours during that during this period, you know, the last part of October and the first few days of November, he'll go around and he's looking for does and heat at the same time, but he's also looking for any bucks that dared to come back, including those pesky uh, uh, yearling bucks. Chase them out of there, run them off. So, 
it's kind of a hard time for a big dominant breeding buck. He's got all this to do. Some buck, some of them have ranges as large as two square miles. Not many, but man, that's quite the job of keeping it clear of all these other bucks. But some of them are able to do that. But at any rate, that's what ground scrapes are made for. And uh, now, there have been years recently when it's been unusually warm in October and November. November, no snow like we usually have in Minnesota during our firearm hunting season. And when you get unusually warm temperatures, that can totally kill this whole business of making ground scrapes and antler runs. So that kind of a year, if it's really warm in October, early November, you might not find hardly, you might find very few of these kind of ground scrapes. Now, antler rubs are in the same category. Uh, white bucks love to make antler rubs. Uh, I think later it gets to be in October, the more those trees that they, these, these antler rubs they make become foes in battle, you know. And they'll push on them and grunt. And even, you know, oh, I've heard bucks grunt like crazy, clattering antlers on tree trunks. And they're, they're, they're rubbing off all the bark until they get down to the bare wood. They've got a bright white marker, you know, that far off the ground. It can be seen way over there, quite a ways away. And then they rub that scalp musk on, from the sides of your heads on that spot. Get it all over that bright white spot on the tree. And that serves the same purpose. That's another no trespassing sign made by a buck telling other bucks, stay out of this area. And that musk, that, that large amount of scalp musk put on there by a dominant buck, is a feature that tells all those other bucks, this is made by that big guy, that big dangerous buck that we're going to be afraid of. So, but those, all of these are made along, most all of, along trails within doe ranges. That's where he wants, he doesn't want any other bucks in those doe ranges. So when you find them, single ones, they're almost always within doe home ranges. Now, big bucks during, throughout this period until breeding begins, commonly go back to their normal bedding areas. Same bedding area they've been using since spring. All summer long, early fall, keep going back to the same place. Really a well hidden area, out of the place, hideaway where they feel particularly safe. And they aren't really big, usually. They're only one or two or three acres at, at most. And while they're there, they, they're they not very sleepy there. All this excitement about keeping bucks out and uh, patrolling their ranges, uh, they're pretty restless and they're, they're getting aggressive because uh, while this is going on, testosterone, the male sex hormone, is starting to uh, really increased to high levels in their bloodstreams, and so they're going to be really aggressive. And so, while they their time when they're in, in a bedding area, they'll often make antler rubs. Some of these big bucks will make as many as 30 of them, you know, in a half acre area, all kinds of them, uh, where most of them are on larger trees, some will be on a little smaller, but big bucks, the big dominant breeding, they're most common size tree will be at least three inches. They can be much bigger, six inches. But they like three inch diameter trees. And when they fight that thing, they get there rubbing on that and pretty soon they're, it's like they're in battle and they'll start really give it, putting a lot of pressure on that tree. And they want the tree to bend. And when it bends, it's giving ground. You know, the way they win, bucks win battles when they're battling each other with their antlers engaged is by forcing the other buck to give ground and finally jump away for fear of being injured. Some of them maybe are being injured in the process. They've got an antler in their side of their neck or something, you know, just really painful kind of thing. And a big buck with white antlers, he can turn his head and gouge those guys and, and he can get them off balance and practically knock them down, they got to jump away. So anyway, uh, they, uh, uh, once all these, all these deer are chased out of range, 
Yeah, well, wherever you, when you're scouting, wherever you find an area where there are lots of, ground, lots of antler rubs, fresh ones, you know, these were made during the last half of October and perhaps the first few days of November. They're fairly fresh. Boy, they're really white, easy to spot. You find a place like that. Whenever I find an, a freshly made antler rub, the bigger ones in the woods, um, I go over there and check it out because it might be a bedding area of a big buck. And you get over there, oh geez, there's another one there, and oh, there's another one there, and oh, there's another one over there. It's a bedding area. Once I establish that, I get out of there. When you ruin the safety, of a, of a big buck's bedding area, the safest place it knows, it's going to abandon that bedding area and, and probably its entire home range for the rest of the hunting season. Now, if you scout two weeks early, he'll be back. He'll be back in his range by that time, two weeks later, doing predictable things and predictable areas. What if you did it the day before the hunting season or during the hunting season? All of a sudden, you, you've absolutely ruin your your chances of taking that big buck. Now I used to hunt big bucks at bedding areas. Uh, they were really predictable. About 17th of November I wanted to hunt a buck bedding area. And I've got quite a few of them that way. They were returning. And they're really tired then. <laughs> they want nothing more but to slip because they're pretty worn out deer. They've lost a lot of weight. Some of them up to a third of their total weight by this time. A lot of their fat stores gone with all the exertions they went through. They want to go back, but one of the things too, you know, with all these amber and ground scrapes out there in the woods at that time, you got, let's say you got a nice cool fall and things were pretty normal, uh, you'll notice that a lot of them, when you look at the ground scrape and gee, it hasn't been re refreshing for a long time. It's getting kind of old looking, you know, getting dull. Leaves have fallen on it or snow is on it partially and that nobody has cleaned it up. It hasn't been refreshing. There isn't fresh dirt kicked way over here on the snow. Or those leaves haven't been cleaned off. Those are antler, those are ground scrapes made by these lesser adult bucks that the big dominant buck chased out. And they're living off range during the last half of October, especially the last week or two, and all of the time that breeding is in progress. They do that. They've been through this before. They know the program. So it's not a good idea to go back there until breeding is over. They'll stay off ranch willing. Usually in a small area. They might make a lot of antler rubs in the ground scrape and a little island out in a bog and maybe one every three, four feet along a, one little trail on this little island in the bog and, and renew them every day. If you know places like that, it can be an awfully good place to take a mature buck during the hunting season because you get close to one without being identified. Sometime during that day, probably within an hour or two, you're going to see the buck that's been making all those signs out there and you can get them. And I've, we, we take quite a few lesser mature bucks uh, each season uh, at places like that where we know we can find uh, lesser adult bucks. And uh, some of them can be pretty good size. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, so that now you know all about what ground scrapes are about and antler rubs. Now, when I was younger, I used to call that buck sign. I never thought about tracks and droppings being buck sign. But the proper size tracks and the proper size droppings are the best buck signs there are because where they're fresh, this is an area where this deer is active right now if you haven't alarmed them in the process of planning. And if you can get out of here and come back later, like later today or tomorrow morning, and that buck has not been alerted alarmed by you while you were here, you've got a good chance of seeing that buck in this vicinity in the morning or later today. You know, like find him on the way back to camp at lunchtime or your truck or whatever. Uh, but the very fresh tracks tell you the portions of this square mile that this buck is active in right now. He was today, maybe an hour ago. He's still going to be active here all during the time that whitetails are feeding. That's when they're most active during those feeding hours. And this begins 
first light in the morning, actually it begins before that, but from first light until about 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock right up because wolves, wolf country bucks are heading back to their bedding areas by 9 o'clock usually. But anyway, uh, those that's buck sign. You know, buck sign is uh, tracks three and three eighths to four inches long and droppings uh, five eighths to one inch long. That's buck sign. Clumped droppings like that is buck sign. And if that deer wasn't alarmed, if he was just walking, yeah, he didn't. He wasn't running or trotting, going, moving rapidly. The odds are very good you're going to see that buck again today, later today, or tomorrow morning in the same spot. So that's what that means. So pay more attention to that than to ground scrapes or antler rubs. Now, that's basically all you need to know about those two, those two signs. So with that, there's there are really some more signs like, boy, if you find a fresh ground scrape, when, while breeding is in progress, that might be bonanza for taking a big buck. Read all about that <laughs> in this book. Um, and there's a lot more, really, actually, to know about antler rubs and grouse cuts. But if you, if you didn't know this before, or if you've heard other stories about it, don't believe it. What I'm telling you, this, uh, this information is based on, what, uh, 80, no, not 80, uh, 50 years. Yeah, no, 60 years, 60 years of scientifically based research. So this is the trope. And if you, if you, this is the kind of information that makes it possible for you to be a regularly successful hunter of mature buck. So you're going to want this book. <laughs> and so are your kids, yeah? And someday, when you're too old to go out there anymore, and gee, I'm 84, I'm still going to go out there. But when you're too old to go out there, your kids will be using this book. And that's good. You want your kids to learn the right stuff right from the beginning and start being successful hunters right from the beginning. So uh, if you have children, if you want your sons and daughters to be hunters like you and hunting partners for the rest of your life, this is a book for them. Boy, they'll love it with all the pictures and the big bucks in there. They'll love this book. And so will you. Well, with that now, uh, be sure now before you before you uh, turn this off, uh, go down there and press that red button down or subscribe to my YouTube channel, will you please? Uh, I need you to do that. It's you guys that subscribe that make it possible for me to continue p providing you with hunting seminars like the kind you just heard. So do that, will you please? And then poke that little thumbs up button as well. Yeah. It might seem like a silly thing to do, but it's important to me. So, thank you again. We'll see you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my eBooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries, my website bookstore, and much more.